Okay, just hooking things up, getting things happening. Give me one sec, we're just going to get our stream sorted so that we can see where we are, check that everything's coming through okay. Let's just bring this up and see where we are. Oh, looking pretty good. Hi, it's David Shumi, and I'm uh, here this evening just uh, having a look at a floater frame, which is something that is used around uh, canvases. And what it is, is a frame that doesn't have a rebate, or at least the rebate is really odd. It sits down behind the piece. And uh, I've got a painting on the table here. I'm gonna pick, pick up the, the actual painting, take it out of, the, out of the piece for a second and show you what the frame looks like. And then we'll have a look at the painting itself. Uh, but what I wanted to show you this evening is not so much uh, how, we, uh, how we make, how we construct and join the frame, because you've seen that before. But this is how you actually fit a picture into one of these floater frames, or sometimes they're called silhouette frames. And so the frame itself, I'll just hold it up. We got there, it's actually an L shape uh, molding. And so the canvas itself is gonna fit into this frame rather than uh, go in from behind, it goes in from the front. So it's a little bit different than your normal frame. And a lot of people wonder, well, how do you get a painting fitted into it? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how I do it, or, and people do things different ways. So you can adopt your own method, but we like to use some screws and things to hold things in place because then we know it's secure. And what I'm gonna do is show you how I finish it off and how we actually get that painting to line up nicely. Because the idea of this frame is it's a very minimalist approach. And this one has a really nice little sharp uh, beveled silver edge which leads the viewer into the artwork. Works well with a lot of contemporary paintings, and also we see a lot of traditional uh, paintings starting to use this kind of uh, framing. Now, where I'm gonna put the, uh, the piece, there is actually a little void between the painting and the stretcher, uh, uh, the painting and the frame itself, and that little void is what creates this silhouette, or the unusual component that gives you that extra dimension into the painting. So I'm going to turn the camera around in a sec. We're going to pop it down onto the table and you can see how we do things. The process is we're going to actually deal with how we do the backing on the, on the canvas itself because we want to make sure nothing gets in there. Then we're going to look at how we uh, fit the painting to this frame itself. And uh, so join with me. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat below, I'll, uh, in, in the comments. I'll always duck in and have a look at that. We're broadcasting today from Fixer Frame in Brisbane, that's in Australia. So if you're joining us and watching this live, by all means, you can always comment. I go back and look at those comments over time. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments because I'm here to help you. If you want to learn picture framing basic stuff, you can go to pictureframeclass.com or a lot of people know us from framersclub.com where we have a huge archive of picture frame training. And of course, if you're local in Brisbane and you want to come in and get something framed, come in and see us at Fixer Frame. So enough of the plug, we'll just get stuck straight into this frame. I'm going to pop this down out of the way and we'll just uh, grab our painting. Let's pop that out there for a sec. So. In this example, we've actually got a, a painting that's uh, on linen. I'll, I'll turn the piece down in a second. But on the back, you can see this is on a stretcher. It's a braced, uh, a braced stretcher frame, and the painting is actually on primed linen. So this is a beautifully stretched piece and uh, a lovely painting, oil on, oil on linen. So I'm just going to pop it down on the flat on some clean craft paper. Uh, need to be careful with paintings that you don't actually harm the front of it. This one has had a varnish oh, several weeks back, so it is, it's still reasonably fresh, but I don't want it to stick there, so I've just put it down uh, carefully. I don't want to be moving it around on the table. So I'm going to turn the camera around now. We'll pop it down onto the, ca onto the table, and you can see what I do first step sort of with finishing it off. So bear with me, I'll just turn this round. might just check this on my other camera angle just to make sure that we're really seeing what uh, what we need to see let's come around a little bit more you can 
that's pretty good. I think you'll I think you'll get most of most of what I'm going to do right there. So that that's going to show it. So what I've done is I've laid this canvas down on the on the table itself. I'm not going to move it around. But the first thing I like to do is actually put a backing on it because in this example, rather than putting the backing on afterwards, we're going to put the backing on first. And so I've got uh, just a, an acid free uh, foam board backing. And the reason I like to use this is one, it gives a, a rigid uh, support to the back of the piece and it actually prevents dust from building up in this linen. Some people leave paintings open like this, but really underneath this stretcher bar there, there is a little gap. And if you hang uh, canvases on the wall like this, what can happen is the dust builds up in that little slot underneath and over time that creates more surface area and then the dust build, uh, that, that build up of dust and that increased surface area traps moisture and that causes problems with mold in the future. So you don't want any mold or fungus to happen and you certainly don't want any insects, bugs living in this little section in the back of the painting because it can, some of them can eat the linen. We don't want any of that. Uh, so we like to seal it. Different people use different materials, but in this example, we are using uh, a foam board backing. And this, uh, this foam itself is going to also lift the painting up just another couple of millimeters, which brings it up just beneath flush on the outer frame. So I've pre-cut this and I've cut it slightly smaller by about uh, 12, 12 to 15 millimeters uh, or in total. So it's about six mil or a quarter of an inch smaller all round. Now you may need to cut that smaller again, like if it's in here, uh, and you, some people might use a dark color if you're going to see it from the front. But with this, this is so deep in the frame that you will not see this backing. And I've just brought it in from the edge so that we don't don't show it. So first up, I'm just going to staple that in. I'm going to use just a, a new hook. I'm just going to use a pneumatic stapler there and hook it up to one of our airlines. You might hear compressors and things go off as, as I work, but don't worry about any background noise. So I'm just gonna, this is really just to hold it in place and provide a sealed edge. So I'm gonna go around and just staple in position. I make sure that it's actually reasonably uh, lined up before I add extra staples. So in this case, potentially four or five, maybe six staples on each side. And really, this is not a structural uh, part, this stapling. It is really there to hold this backing down and prevent, say, bugs and things getting in through the gap and also prevent dirt from building up on the back of the frame. Gee, that'll be okay like that. I might even put one up in there, that's okay. So, I've just gone around and stapled this. I'm not going to apply any seal to it at this stage. Often with, if you were going to just hang a canvas on the wall, uh, you could just take, uh, take that frame and use some of the, the brown gum tape to seal over this if you wanted to, and you could put some hangers on it. That is better than hanging a canvas without any backing on it. So I strongly recommend that you put a backing on your canvases, whether it be a hard backing like this, or whether it's even a soft uh, linen backing or canvas calico backing over it, just so the dust doesn't build up. So that's step one, just putting that backing on the painting. I'm gonna pick it up carefully. So we've got our canvas, you can see it's, it's, it's actually got quite a gloss on it, it shows up in the lights that we've got on today. But I'm gonna stand it up over on the little support piece I've got, just to keep it out of the way for a sec, because we're gonna come back and we're gonna put that into the frame. So with our, uh, with our silhouette frame, what I like to do with something like this, first of all, is we're gonna to have to position this somehow, and so, I've got some little bits of board. First of all, I'm just going to use that. I've, I, I haven't measured this, but I'm just going to use that to mark a, a little line in from the edge so that I get a, using it as a template. You would could measure that up to be a position where you are going to do some uh, screw fittings to hold this canvas in place. 
I'm just measuring using that rather than a tape measure at this point because I find it quicker to use a, a little jig. So just using that one. And in the center, I'm just gonna put one in the center too. So these are just positions. So basically 40 inches, pretty much. So 20 and an eighth internally, thinking in Imperial, but sometimes when I'm doing division work in picture framing, even though we work in metric in Australia, obviously maths is a lot easier if you're dividing a smaller number. So it's something easier to, to split you know, 40 inches in half than 1,017 millimetres or something, or even dividing things up into three, whatever. Whenever you've got to do uh, some complex maths, it's often easier to work in inches. Um, so I've just marked that up, and I've got a scrap piece of uh, stretcher bar. The reason for that is I just wanted to put something down on this table. Often we'll use different blocks of wood. I brought this out here because usually with things like this we're fitting them out in our other workshop but i just want to put something under here so that i can come in and drill a little hole because i'd like to pre-drill this rather than dive straight in and um and screw straight into the back of the painting so i'm just using like a little uh probably two and a half mil or might even be a little bit more but i just i haven't measured it. i just grabbed a a reasonably small drill bit out of my uh, my kit and what I want to do is I'm going to drill a hole that is in uh, out of the way from the area that might be seen from the face even though you won't see it at this depth and I want to put a little hole all the way through into the backing so we're just going to go around and drill some little holes here And this is where we're going to screw into the painting itself. But if you hang on, I'll definitely show you some tips as to how to get the painting to line up properly. That is probably the hardest thing. Well, it can be hard because if you line it up incorrectly, what happens is you end up with a painting that looks crooked in the frame. And we don't want any of that to happen. So we've got a few little tips that I'll share with you in a minute, so do hang around. So yeah, I've just drilled a few holes there. Couple up the other end. And I like to pre-drill, like pre-drilling something like this ensures you get the, the screws in the right place. The stretcher itself is rather, um, it's not a, it's a softwood, uh, in the stretcher so you're not I'm not going to drill into the stretcher frame itself on the painting I'll allow the self tappers of the uh, screws that we're going to use to drill into the actual painting themselves but here I just wanted to make that positioning nice and easy so that we knew where we were going to put the put the uh, put the screws Sometimes it's just a little bit random, but when you do it this way, you end up with a uniform uh, pressure holding the painting in place. Now that dust, just tip it out here. I'm gonna give it a bit of a blow just to get rid of it. We've got a little air blower on the, uh, that we can attach to our airline here just so that we don't have any dust around. I don't particularly want any uh, dust there with the painting, really because I don't wanna have something and put it down on the, uh, down on the table itself and find that we have um, issues with getting any uh, anything into the canvas. So let's give a little bit of a blow off. Painting's not going to go back down onto this uh, table, but I don't really want to say dust is not a particularly good thing with pictures, so we we'll keep that out of the way. So at this stage, we've got uh, six, ten holes drilled in to our silhouette frame and we got it there face up. I'm then going to go and I cut earlier some little off cuts of just five millimeter foam board. Because in this example, the, uh, the canvas is going to sit up, it was measured to sit five mil in because the client wants a five mil space there. Now you can make 
any amount of space that you like for your picture. Personally, I like something like seven or eight mil where it's a little bit wider, so it gives a little bit, little bit more breathing space. But in e everybody has their own opinion about how wide to allow around it. So in this case, we're going to allow um, approximately five millimeters. Now the thing about that is if, if I grab this foam board, which is five or six mil thick, it, I'd like to actually put a little wedge on that so that I don't uh, harm the painting as such. And so this is just a little nylon block that I use a lot of the time. You might see in my videos for burnishing things. And I'm just gonna rub this foam just so that I put a little taper. So we're tapering down this way, making a, a slight wedge shape. And that I'm gonna use for positioning. So I've got a few of these. I've tapered that one, I tapered a couple beforehand. I just want some angle on there, just so that we can push it in without really getting any uh, undue pressure. Like I wanna have the position right, I wanna be able to get the, I wanna be able to get the painting in the right place. And stack these up, another one there. So I need probably eight, maybe 10, to position this correctly so that I don't get things out of whack. So yeah, tapered those down. Then I'm gonna put that painting into the frame. And it sits down, and this is what's unusual about a silhouette, is it sits, or a floater frame, is that the canvas sits down into the, into the frame here. So at the moment, you can see, if I move this around from underneath, there's play in how this piece is. So what we need to do is to get that positioned, uh, and we do that with those little pieces of foam that I'd created the wedge on. So I can put you know, a wedge down in here, and so on. I'll put a couple around the painting. I don't really want to push too hard on the canvas itself. But if I wedge these in, Again, without being too brutal, just using gentle pressure because I don't want to scuff or damage the painting in any way. And that's something, depending on the, I mean, it depends on the work that you're doing. Sometimes people do prints and canvas prints this way. Um, I need to move over just a little bit. Like a little bit more of a wedge on this one, just I could move it over, but I've already got a slight amount of tension in there, and I'd just like to use the wedge itself to bring that over, and so on. I've got two left. I'm going to put them on the other side. And just gently, gently wedge into position. So really, what we've got is we've used these blocks to get our canvas lined up so that we end up with a nice even space because that's really quite crucial to how the whole thing looks if we uh, if we had it off it would look really odd when the whole thing's done now so I've got this face up on the table I'm gonna just hang the corner of this painting off the edge here for a sec and what that's doing is it's allowing me access to the back of it in this spot and it's gonna give me access to the back in this spot. And the reason for that is, is I'd like to put in a screw at this point to hold it in place. Now, some people use nails and things to hold paintings like this, but if you're using a nail and the picture drops or falls, it's gonna fall out of the frame. It's not gonna really have any uh, particular strength in holding. Whereas if you're using something like a, a screw, oh, and I actually like to use these flat, flat screws, and something I forgot, which I would have remembered, we're gonna take this back out again, something that I do normally before I even drill the hole actually, but that's why I forgot today, but I'm glad I remembered before I screwed this together, is, I'll just we, we pop this out, beauty of live broadcast, but that's great because I'd rather find this out now before I uh, put it together. And that is just on the back. So quick tip for you guys here, I'm going to take the painting back out again. On the back here, 
this is actually the raw section of frame. Now some people would finish this section off afterwards after they've screwed everything together. But I've found with something like this, it's actually quite nice if you just use your framing tape before you've actually fitted the, the picture in place. And the reason for that is then I can actually get to this whole line and just have it clean. Like this is going to clean up the back, make it quite nice. We always like the back of our framing to look uh, almost as good as the front. I mean, obviously they don't look as good in the back as they do on the front, but you should be proud of the back of your frames because ultimately the back of your frame also influences what people think about your framing. So, place can burnish this down again. That's my universal little burnishing tool that I use. Some people use water-based tape. We still use a lot of good old water-based craft tape for taping these pieces. But we found this uh, Japanese tape that we've got here, the Rinrei variety, tends to work really quite well with, um, I'll slip that around, tends to work, work really well with sealing, particularly if you burnish it. Like I, it. It's not so great if you just stick it down like that or wipe it with a cloth. Some people smooth them down with their fingers. But I just find if I really go at it with the get the heat, I think is what it is, get some of the heat into it from this little nylon block that I use. And what that does, that just makes sure that that tape bonds really well. We don't like things to peel off or bubble off or, or look bad in the future. And so by sealing that down, it really gives the, the tape a chance, you know, it's like the, the rule of mounting in picture framing is always time, temperature and pressure. So if you're sticking down a picture, well it's pretty much the same with a tape. Like time, temperature and pressure will make that tape stick better. So it will bond further after time, but it does need pressure and heat will help improve that. So by burnishing like this, it's actually putting quite a bit of heat into that tape, helping that adhesive both bond securely and stick to that section on the back of the frame. So we'll just come around and do that last side. So yeah, a little bit odd that we're going to have that tape on first, but you'll see when I finish it, because we're using these um, flat headed screws rather than a countersunk variety. Some people would countersink them and maybe tape over the screws. But when we've done it this way, we've found our artists really like it because if they want to change their painting, like often an artist will paint on the same size uh, canvas. And if you've screwed it in nicely and neatly from the back this way, then it's quite easy for either them or you at a later stage to come in and just um, take that painting out and you don't have to take the whole backing off. So I'm just going to go around, you can see I'm just finding the holes. I'll be able to grab them anyway, but I just want to have a quick look at to see where that where that hole where that hole is so that when we come in and we've turned it back over again I'm not fiddling around underneath the table trying to find it. Got to be careful of bits and pieces on your table. Just use a little guide again. Find a find a template. Look for the hole. Yeah, you can sort of see where the where the hole is. There is a little indentation, but that one didn't have a great angle for me to look at. You wrap your finger along it, try and find that. I think we're good there. Let me have a feel. There we go. So yeah, these holes, 
we drilled from the other side, but now that we've taped over, this is going to provide the sealed backing that's going to make the whole thing look good when we're done. Different people finish the backs of their frames off in other ways. Some people put paper dust covers and things, all sorts of methods. Um, there are preferred ones for different reasons and in different circumstances. I tend to prefer the hard physical backing where I can because that's going to give me more protection from uh, getting knocked. In fact, some people would like to use a, a wooden or masonite backing in that circumstance purely because it's, um, it's going to give even more uh, security to that, uh, that piece. Foam board does puncture. That is probably its one uh, weak part, part of it, but it has it is used a lot by picture framers nowadays simply because it has no dust when you cut it. So that helps with picture framers health. And also, it's quite rigid and quite strong. And if you use some of the better quality foam boards, uh, they're quite long lasting, certainly the archival variety like the Art Care variety of foam boards. In fact, in Australia, you can get your, uh, your foam board from foamboards.com.au. They have all ranges of uh, varieties of foam board for Australian uh, picture framers. Now, where did I lose that last piece so I can use this other one? Oh, there we go. Just started making sure I put the wedge, wedge on the on the painting. I don't want to squash it too much there. So what that's done, I've just wedged it. I've got it in position. I now have finished taping on the backing. So I turn that back to that diagonal again, just so I can get underneath here. And then I'm going to put. These are just like a, a 25 mil. Have a look at that one. These are like a 25 mil uh, flat headed screw, a wood screw, uh, and I'm going to use 10 of these to hold this uh, painting in place. I'll get some screws out. Go back to a slow speed. Like you tend to use a high speed on your drill for um, drilling holes, but when you're screwing something in, have it on a slow speed. Uh, you want to be able to not damage the timber or anything when you're pushing into it. So I'm just going to find that hole, gently hold the painting. I don't want to put too much pressure on. Now what I do, I put it in, but I'm going to back it off again and then just come back in again. And what that does is the first uh, impact of the screw started to drill the hole and just push the canvas up a little bit and rather than me force down on the painting I just let the let the painting rise up that little bit and then that's why I backed it off and then I come back again and that way the painting is uh, better protected than me trying to force a screw into the back of it so sort of a two-step thing in a little bit that I come back again and then I come in again and it's on that second drive that it actually pulls the painting into place. Now those pieces of foam are holding everything up in position, so we're going to end up with it in perfect alignment. I'm going to pop these other ones up the top here. Obviously, you could wear gloves if you're concerned about damage to the surface of the painting. See where that hole is a little bit difficult in the light under here. Let's see with our. It's one handy thing that we've got with this. Um, one handy thing. This is a little cheap. 
<laughs> one of those little dead cheap drills. Now you can get so many of them from China. Um, but we go through these quite a bit and we found that the price of the batteries is always the, the hardest thing. Well, one good thing about this one, at least when you turn it on, it's got a little, it's got a little light. Like, I don't know if you see it there, just uh, down, on the, down on the bottom here, this little light lights up the work area so while I'm underneath there at least it helps me have a bit of a vision of where those screws are going. Now we actually need one in the center I'll just move that around and put one there while I've still got it this way around. So yeah turn, turning the, the screwdriver on just to see the actual light there to where we're going. So it's like in, out, and then back in again. So that then you're actually getting that bite on in the, in the piece. Now I'm just gonna rotate diagonally across that corner of the table again so I can get to the other side. We'll come underneath, have a little look there. Yeah, so it's sort of a combination you could drill a little hole if you want up into the to the canvas from bit the back but um, I find that these self tappers work work really well particularly if you do that um, back off and back on kind of uh, motion because the first time it hits it lifts it up a little bit and then when you come back into it it just pulls it down and into the frame. Yeah, so it seems a little bit odd that you do it twice, but uh, it does work that way very well. All right, that's the most awkward one because of the lighting here. I've got some LED lighting running to light up got some quite bright uh, LED lights running to light the back of our uh, to light this up so you guys can see it while we're working and when I'm down there looking that way I'm looking pretty much right into one of those lights so it's just a little bit tricky this last one here I'm going to just stand it up and actually we'll have a little look I'm going to put one in on the top there, just bear with me. Same thing, in, out, back it off. So now let's have a little quick look at the front. These uh, foam wedges, you can gently remove those without doing any harm to the painting itself. Just wiggle them out. That's given us all that perfect positioning. And what we're going to do now, I'll show you how it looks first up. We've got the, that's upside down for you guys, but let's, so painting is in frame, but I want to show you the finishing. We've got the little lip where this is our void that runs all the way around and our little silver lip there. So it actually makes it really quite, quite elegant. And on the backing, I'll just finish the back off so you can see what's going on. Here we've got our, our screws, I'll hold it up there so you can have a bit of a look, the screws sit flat over that tape and that enables anybody to see how to take it off and it's really quite solid in its, product, in its uh, construction. Now I can put the painting down on the table here now, the painting is not touching the table, the frame's touching the table and you can see where our screws are all the way around. So simple thing then, I'm going to apply a couple of little foam uh, sorry, not foam, little felt uh, bumpers or bump-ons, depends on where you're from, what you call them. But they're there to, again, stop the painting touching the wall in these corners so it allows uh, air circulation. And that way we have a great chance that, um, that it will be really uh, well circulated. Now, with hanging this work, um, 
sometimes we put a we might actually put a large uh, d-ring but often I'll use these uh, these flat uh, flat plate hangers and the reason for that is is this frame itself has quite a narrow uh, section so you've either got to put something back here I'm well, not put it there but up up in the other spot you've either got to put it back and I'll grab a, a corner to show you what I mean So, when you're looking at this, this frame section, this is a very similar one, it's a slightly different colour, you've only really got a very narrow piece of wood here to work with, or quite a thin vertical section. So, if you're going to put a screw, you either want the piece to come up close to where that, that section is, or you want to put something back in the, in the guts of it, and have maybe the screw come into the canvas itself, um, but again, you don't ever hang the painting by, say there is stretcher underneath here. We know there's, there's a little bit of stretcher here, but you do not want to apply force by hanging off the stretcher itself. So if you're putting D-rings, like ideally, some of the D-rings that go in there, I'll just get some out of, our, out of our rack. I'll get one of the bigger ones. We've, we've got we've got different types of rings there's all sorts of different sizes and what have you um, so these are some larger larger type rings with one hole you've got ones with multiple holes you've got little ones like these sort of small fittings here now this painting's not heavy but I will anticipate that it would go to a gallery so uh, I will be using something that's a little bit more substantial purely because if I put a substantial uh, ring on here then a gallery owner can suspend a vertical uh, hanger from it and at the same time if someone wants to have a wire on there they can have a wire across the piece and they can use it. So I'm going to actually use the ones in this case with the one hole and what that'll do, that'll allow someone to pivot it if they want to have it up this way and hang it off a, off a gallery track or a gallery hanging system, they can do it. Or if it's going to go in someone's home, they can have it running across the way and they can run a cable on it. And running it across with the cable, uh, at least we are using the right angle section, not the stretcher itself that's under there as the main support. So I'm just going to grab some, uh, not the bigger screw these are about 16 uh, millimeters long they're just again a, a little self little self tapping screw and in this case we're going to put that a third of the way down now again people have different preferences as to where they um, where they put their their hangers or the height they put their hangers I'm going to put it a third of the way down in this case so we're not quite 42 so I going to go 13 and a half inches just use inches again easier maths in this in this example I make a little pilot hole and on the other side same thing little pilot hole and we'll put some uh, we'll put some quite heavy duty stainless steel wire on this again not because it's heavy but um, this is quite a, uh, a little premium job and we want both the strength of the wire and if an artist, you know, artists have a habit of when they're delivering paintings, if it's not wrapped up all the way and someone's going to carry it, you should always carry a painting with at least two hands on the, on the frame. And often on big paintings, they put them on trolleys and things in galleries. But what you'll find artists do is they grab the painting by the wire and they try to carry it. And I've had complaints, if we use anything too low gauge, that it hurts their hands. So often you'll find artists themselves putting like a length of plastic tubing over the wire. And you keep thinking, oh, is that to protect the hook or something like that? But often it's because an artist wants to carry that by the wire. And they might be carrying two paintings, one in each hand, running to, to, uh, to, an, to an exhibition or an opening rather than you know correctly carrying it by carrying on both sides so in this case uh, I'm going to use what we we call um, our our number six wire which is 19 or 
oh, 27 kilo braking strain. That's sort of overkill, but it is a really nice solid wire. And tying it off again, you've you've seen us tie the wire again. It's through the through the ring, around itself, back down into the ring. Fairly standard knot. And that's what you want to make sure is that you do have a knot if you're using wire. If you just twist the thing off, it'll slip. And over time, you don't want the painting to give way. So in this case, I'm just going to cut that wire. And I'm going to leave it reasonably loose. And the reason for that is that will give enough room if someone wants to pivot these hooks up and hang it on a gallery track system in a gallery, because this is off to a gallery. And when they sell it, they can easily pivot the hooks around and they've got the wire on it ready for a client to have it. So both circumstances are sort of covered. Sometimes you'll find galleries themselves won't even touch this. They'll then go and put another ring, sometimes up here near the top, and run it straight up to a, a gallery hanging system. So we pop it on like that. Normally, the only other thing we do is we pop on our, our little uh, stamp of approval on the back, our little fixer frame checklist, which we'll go through, and we've checked these various components while we've been doing the framing. But we have a checklist on there that always reminds us of what we should be doing with our work. And of course, we like to stand by our checklist. So I give that wire a bit of a tug just to make sure it's strong. We'll pick it up. We'll turn this one around. And what I'll do is I'll flip this camera back up. Just give me one sec. Let's come back this way a little bit. Maybe we can get, we can get the painting in. So what we've got there, I'm gonna try and hold it up for you. We've got this sort of, it's a modern oil, but it's a traditional sort of painting. And we've got that little silhouette line running all the way around. So if you're ever interested in how to uh, put a canvas into one of these floating frames, you've just seen that the steps are quite simple. If you start by drilling the holes, you make the frame, of course, bigger than the canvas by an even amount all round. That is probably the most important thing. You try to use a, a, a frame that is slightly deeper than the canvas. You do not want the canvas sitting proud of that. Frames are there to protect paintings and having a protective layer by this edge certainly protects the canvas a lot better than if you to just hang, hang that canvas on the wall without any frame on it. So we're big supporters of putting a frame on it. Now then, the other things that you'd seen is we'd drilled the holes, we'd actually taped that area, and then after we'd taped it, we put that face up and we fitted it into the frame. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna wrap it up. If you've got any questions, by all means, ask them in the comments below. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time when we broadcast live from Fixer Frame at Mount Cravat. And remember, you can always access the Framers Club archive, if for members, uh, where we've done a lot of complicated framing. And that's ideal for picture framers who want to take their framing to the next level. And they mightn't have ever seen how to frame complex items or, you know, we do things, televisions, all sorts of items that we frame. And we cover those step by step inside the Framers Club. So you can always catch me at fixaframe.com.au. You can visit us in store at Mount Cravat or catch me online sometime. So thanks for joining us today.